Hello, I'm Alan Jones, president of the RIBA. Welcome and thank you all for joining us for the second talk on our new talk series, Architecture and You. We are really happy to have you all here with us tonight as we hear from a panel of artists and designers finding new ways to work with natural materials and traditional technologies. Tonight's event is only the second event in the, in the Architecture and You series, which is our first public talk series dedicated entirely to sustainability. Throughout 2021, it will feature the change makers from across the globe who are already leading the way towards a more sustainable future, embracing social, economic and environmental concerns. Architecture and You is part of our ongoing partnership with Vitra Bathrooms. And I would like to thank Vitra Bathrooms for sponsoring this important series. Tonight's event will be chaired by Hattie Hartman, Sustainability Editor at the Architects Journal. So I am now very pleased to hand over to Hattie to continue with introductions of our speakers and a brief explanation of how to make the most of our digital venue. Hop in, over to you, Hattie. Thank you, Alan. And welcome everyone to this second event in our IBA's Architecture and News series. This series is particularly relevant in light of today's government announcement that the UK is ramping up its climate commitments. A lot of sustainability discourse is wrapped up in targets and roadmaps in the, in the run up to COP26, and that is enormously important. But it's also crucial to share inspirational on the ground examples of how we can do things differently to meet these targets now. And we have four practices represented here today that are doing exactly that. Um, it's also really great to have some voices beyond the UK in this series. If you missed the first lecture, um, I think it's available to, to watch. I, I didn't double check that, but it was a spirited discussion between Indian architect Anupama Kundu and German architect Anna Herringer, whom you can also hear on my Climate Champions podcast, small plug. Um, Architecture Anew has two more lectures coming up, one in May and one in June. You will find details on architecture.com and on the Hopin platform of this event. Today, we have uh, four presentations, two architects, uh, an artist couple uh, from Herefordshire, and a Chinese landscape architect whose presentation will be via video. We will have 10-minute presentations from each of the four, followed by a 25-minute panel discussion between the speakers, and then 15 minutes of Q&A. And the RIBA is using a special platform called Hopin, where audience, you can ask questions live. Um, it's only the second time that the RIBA is using this platform, and I want to quickly outline some key features so you can make the most of it. To the right of the video stream is a chat and Q&A box. Um, please do share your comments throughout in the chat. And for the live Q&A at the end of the talk, webcams and all, please submit your questions via the Q&A for a chance to do this. Backstage, the RIBA's public programs team are going to select a handful of questions and will contact you directly via direct messages in Hopin to share a new web link to join us backstage. So keep an eye on your direct messages and look for a red notification in the top right over a paper airplane, similar to Instagram. Um, so please bear with us as this is a relatively new platform. The entire event is being recorded, including the questions. And after the event, there will be 30 minutes of networking via speed dating. And I must say that I have found breakout rooms and virtual pubs one of the better aspects of this new virtual world that we're in. So I do hope you'll stay and take part. Don't be shy. Um, if you haven't maximized the video stream, you'll see the networking button on the right-hand side of the screen. And if you click on it, it will match you up automatically with another willing member of the audience, and you will have uh, up to three minutes for a chat. 
And this will be a 30 minute, um, 30 minute networking after the event. Uh, one further aspect of Hopin is the info zone, which hosts further information on the remaining talks in the series, um, a chance to speak to our sponsors, and also a special discount to RIBA's bookshop uh, for this, let me see if I can get this right, this book, Everything Needs to Change by Sophie Pelsmakers and Nick Newman of Studio Bark. One of the speakers, um, the Chinese landscape architect's work is featured here, as well as other others who are pioneering uh, in this area. Um, so now I think I'm ready to, um, uh, one more thing I wanted to say before introducing the speakers. Earlier this afternoon, before joining this call, I was uh, listening in on the Architects Declare conference, which included a brilliant keynote by a climate strategist um, and author called Gabrielle Walker. And she concluded with a photograph of a plaque um, that was installed on the, the viewing platform of a glacier in Iceland in 2019. And it's entitled Letter to the Future. And it reads as follows. This is the first Icelandic glacier to lose its status as a glacier. In the next 200 years, all our glaciers are expected to follow the same course. This plaque acknowledges that we know what's happening and we know what needs to be done. Only you, that is the people who are looking at this glacier or former glacier in the future, uh, will know if we did it. So let's now hear from some practitioners who are doing it now. Um, I'm gonna introduce all four speakers and then we'll have the four presentations. First up is Paloma Gar Gormley of Practice Architecture. Paloma is a researcher, designer, builder, and educator with more than a decade in practice. She founded Material Cultures in 2019 to use one-to-one -one prototypes and digital technologies to explore new approaches to sustainable materials. Um, I first came across Paloma's work as a judge on AJ Small Projects, where you submitted a project built out of hemp on Margent Farm with London Met students. And um, I look forward to hearing what else you're up to. Paloma will be followed by Heather and Ivan Morrison of Studio Morrison, an artist duo whose work really bridges the boundary between art, sculpture, and and architecture. Their projects range from an origami-like mesh pavilion and music in Munich, conceived to increase awareness about homelessness, to an extraordinary thatch structure in Cambridgeshire in a natural reserve that you see here uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the image, um, commissioned by the Wising Arts Center and the National Trust. And it was completed just before the pandemic. Then we will hear from Jonathan Tucky, whose 16 strong practice specializes in retrofit and is increasingly working with regenerative materials such as timber and uh, hemp and rammed earth. His practice recently won planning approval for a passive house home in an area of outstanding natural beauty west of Salisbury, um, a project on which he has collaborated with Swiss um, rammed earth expert, Martin Rao. Finally, we will have a video talk from Chinese landscape architect Kong Zhan Yu, who runs a practice of 300 in Beijing and has pioneered a concept called Sponge City with extraordinary results in a very short amount of time. I wish he were here with us, uh, but he conveys this really well uh, in this video. And since I think it's 26 or 28 percent of emissions are coming from China. Solutions that address big problems in China are, are really urgent. So it's great to have that represented in this talk. So Paloma, over to you. You have 10 minutes. I'll try to give you a one minute warning if I can. Um, Hello, that feels like a challenge. Um, so yeah, as um, it's been described, I guess I'm here with a couple of hats on. Um, I run a practice called Practice Architecture and have done for over 10 years now um, with my colleague Lettuce. Um, but more recently established Material Cultures, which is a kind of platform, it's kind of research-based project. 
um, or organization um, where they kind of remit to explore this kind of intersection between uh, low embodied carbon materials and, and kind of new technologies. So today I'm just going to be presenting some of the ideas behind the work. Um, so for the last 50 years, we've been using crude oil to try and solve problems of sustainability in architecture, either in the form of kind of insulating high performance products such as polyurethane or poly styrene insulations, things like nylon thermal resistors, PVC airtight membrane brains, in ETFE thermal cushions, all extraordinary things, or in the form of technology made from materials whose availability is dependent on vast quantities of cheaply um, produced oil, so materials such as steel, aluminium, glass, and these materials kind of come in the form of uh, air conditioning systems, heat recovery units, triple glazing, these technologies are unfortunately neither durable nor expected to last. Um, most contemporary buildings require very specialist knowledge increasingly um, and equipment to maintain them. It's knowledge that's easily lost and often um, kind of economically accessible to people and it's dependent on parts that quite readily get out of production. This kind of technification of architecture has concentrated the power in the hands of the technocrats. Our current material culture <clears throat> transforms vast quantities of extracted materials into vast quantities of waste, and it does so extraordinarily efficiently. In doing so, we've created whole new subterranean ecosystems, which are the likely minds of the future. Um, and these hosts kind of new forms of organism which are mutating in order to attempt to digest that waste, including plastics, actually. This is the oil age of architecture. Um, the circular economy, which is um, kind of increasingly, I think, well understood, but um, is essentially the idea that in order to think meaningfully about sustainability in relation to human production, we need to consider the entire life cycle of everything that we produce from cradle to uh, cradle to grave or cradle to cradle as per the circular principle. Embedded in this principle are three key material cycles. So there's composting, recycling and reuse. So William um, Donahue, who wrote Cradle to Cradle, the kind of founding text of the circular economy, uh, recently developed the innovation for the circular economy house, the ice house, uh, which is a house or, or building system you could see it as, which is made entirely of polycarbonate, aluminium and aerogel. These very high energy kind of carbon, sorry, very high energy and carbon building materials are justified by the idea that the system is designed to be demountable, which means it could be reassembled elsewhere in the future. However, due to the number of components and their complex, complex dependencies, implementing reuse and recycling and construction in a meaningful way represents an immense and potentially insurmountable logistical challenge. Ultimately, it demands vast warehouses, distribution networks and mass standardization. It must also acknowledge the inevitable entropy and significant loss of energy and carbon and functionality along the way and the significant energy required to redistribute and recycle these elements. Um, do, sorry. It, yet it's interesting um, that of the three cycles, composting, recycling and reuse, reuse and recycling seems to be receiving the most investment. Why? Perhaps because reuse and recycling maintains the logic of capitalist growth. It's often fanciful narrativization of the future justify the con justifies the continued use of the high energy materials that we've become so dependent on. It allows us to maintain the status quo. As a side note, if pl plastics are to form part of our circular economy, then each kind of recycle returns plastic into our waste streams and particulates into our environments and our oceans. And we're first learning that we need to remove plastics from our material cycles, not to perpetually re reintroduce them. 
reuse and recycling very quickly become highly technocratic and standardization means fewer authors. We lose sight of architecture as a crucial mode of cultural production and we further consolidate the almost total monopoly of the white technocratic author. Or perhaps, perhaps as Bell Hooks might say, that in this move towards standardization, you can see the mechanisms of the white supremacist capitalist patriarchy at work. The reality is that the circular economy is not possible with the materi materials that we currently depend on. So what's the alternative? How do we respond to the evolving needs of a society without the disastrous effects of our current modes of production and growth? Composting, fermentation, microbial digestion, fungal and, iron, and enzymatic decomposition. These are the kind of processes by which nature deals with its waste. These processes reintegrate matter into our natural cycles from where it has the, uh, the ability to regenerate and regrow. Entropy is the friend of the biological process. So what happens when we work with construction materials that remain part of biochemical and nutrient cycles? Is there a mode of construction where at the end of the life of the constituent parts of the building, they could simply return to the ground? Materials in this mode are not contaminants, in fact, they could belong to the landscape. And this is how we've made things for thousands of years. Biological processes such as anaerobic digestion, which is otherwise known as fermentation, which we're all kind of familiar with, can transform waste into things like usable biogas, which is already happening at scale across the UK. Limes uh, and clays have for centuries undergone fermentation processes in order to condition and improve their performance. And it's a kind of material technology that's at risk of being forgotten. These materials, which are, I guess, natural materials in that they haven't been processed um, very much from, from their kind of origin and extraction, um, they have an inherent plurality there's no kind of vast, unrecoverable investment of energy and carbon to maintain, and therefore they can accommodate many authors and unlimited standards. In fact, bio-based materials generally sequester rather than generate carbon. They're accessible, they require a few specialist tools without, uh, with simple detailing and construction, and often there's something really intuitive about working with them. They allow architecture to be culturally generated and perhaps suggest a different type of relationship to a building situating architecture in relation to care. Repair will require human investment and a different set of relationships to place and territory and the formation of new cultures. Biobase materials can be produced efficiently and at a regional scale and integrate with existing crop cycles. So the other implication is the possibility of architecture to kind of rebuild a direct relationship to place, which means things traveling less far and therefore it being easier to, for them to return and assimilate back into the ecosystem. So this house is a kind of extreme in case in that we grew quite a lot of the materials for it, the kind of hemp plants in the fields just beyond that window. Um, so in this mode, you can see architecture and the making of buildings as a kind of gathering up and curation of, of bits of the landscape. But you can also see that as a bit of a romanticization. Um, and there's another kind of set of questions that come with this. And kind of, are we beckoning in a new era of really intensified industrial agriculture? And can that be, can this be mitigated? Um, what other non-human systems are dependent on that landscape and can, can they be maintained in the process. So Material Cultures, my um, research organisation, uh, is working with Yorkshire Council at the moment to develop a strategy for a bioregional construction economy. So we're looking at how to enable the production and take up of bio-based products and how agroecological processes might be integrated into this transition. Coming straight from the ground, these materials invite direct contact, experimentation and play. And this is at the centre of, 
of our practice, both at practice architecture and material cultures, we feel that there's still a huge amount to learn and to relearn. Perhaps a direct relationship with materials is a way to find new languages that have the potential to supersede those that we've inherited from a historically narrow lineage of authors. Is this all a bit Arcadian? Are we going back um, to the future? We uh, like to think not. We're interested in the role of contemporary tools and modes of construction, meaning um, constructing our site where practical and working with efficient forms of mass production. The problem is huge and needs to be met at scale. And we think that in order to challenge, in order for the change to come quickly enough, the status quo needs to be challenged on ecological and economic terms. And that means embracing digitalized construction processes where repetitive non-specialist labor is carried out by machines. Off-site, we have the ability to improve working conditions and change cultures and to reimagine factories as sites of creativity and cultural production. We're interested in how these ideas scale to the size of a town or even a city. And we're working with Lewis and other places across the UK in order to do this. That's me. Hi there, I guess it's straight into me. Um, I'm Ivan Morrison. Um, I work with Heather Peake um, uh, as part of Studio Morrison, which is the artist-led creative practice that facilitates our um, artwork and also facilitates the work of the people we work with as well. Heather sends her apologies. Um, at the moment, uh, she's held up on a narrowboat that we've just recently designed and built. It's um, it's the UK's first library specifically of short stories and um, uh, there to encourage reading and the writing of them. And at the moment, she's done a very slow journey um, up to Lancashire um, to deliver it for the first, for where it opens uh, next month. Um, so I'll take us through um, the presentation we have. I'll just share my screen. So um, I'm going to take you through uh, three projects. Um, they're all uh, grouped very specifically around um, the themes of today's uh, conversation. Um, our practice is, is quite broad, actually. Um, we probably describe ourselves as uh, working within social sculpture. So there's a large social element to what we do, where we work with people to develop ideas and uh, creative skills um, to give um, communities and groups uh, confidence, I guess, to bring about meaningful change. And often there's objects involved in that. And sometimes those objects are quite big and sometimes they're almost like buildings, um, even though they probably don't function um, as buildings might. So the first piece I want to talk about um, is a piece called How to Survive the Coming Bad Years that we actually made 13 years ago. Um, so it's a bit of a revisit for me. And it's a large um, cob and straw tower based on the Egyptian pigeon towers. Um, I don't know whether anyone's familiar with these amazing, amazing things. Um, we did an extended research trip out to Egypt and the Nile Delta um, to look at these. And um, I've got hundreds of these photos. I'm only going to show you three. They come in various sizes and uh, levels of finish and grandeur and arrangements, um, but all of them share this conical shape with these um, holes going through them. Um, the principle is um, wild flocks of pigeons occupy them. They nest in the holes. The holes are only so big that any more than one um, squab, um, baby pigeon, per, um, um, per what do you call litter of pigeons, I don't know, uh, will fall down inside. Um, the tower and be harvested by the owner of the tower, as will their guano, their poo, will fall down and then that's used as a fertilizer. So it's this amazing uh, symbiotic relationship between 
the animal, which is partly wild, and the human that sort of takes only what's needed um, from uh, from them um, as excess. Um, at the time, we were working more with sort of dystopian ideas um, and building uh, structures that we were calling escape vehicles that kind of uh, spoke to something that might happen from the future in the future, or like a ruin from the future in some way. And this tower was in some way uh, a reflection of how you might build in some sort of catastrophic dystopic future, but also harking back to how you did build and, uh, and as a system of survival and habitation as well. Um, so we, as I say, we build in many ways, um, in some in quite technical ways, but there is a set of projects that we do which really sustain us, that we kind of use as uh, a way for us and our associates and colleagues to come together uh, in something that's more than just the build, it's something that's quite sustaining and um, fun, really. Um, um, so um, and this is a photo of my daughter um, mixing cob. Um, so this project began by us being given a site. I mean, this is how it works for us. I mean, as artists, we're never asked to build a thing. We're always asked to look at a site and decide what action might then be appropriate for that site. Um, and that might be a town or uh, a piece of landscape or a, a group of people. Um, and sometimes, as I say, there are things that we put in there and maybe those things then go on and do things um, with people in them. Um, for this site, we looked around and the, the soil was perfect for cob. There was a field full of straw and there are a lot of saplings that needed felling amongst the large oaks. So the saplings provided the framing and the and the scaffolding. This is before we had too much health and safety uh, or before we knew too much about health and safety, perhaps. Um, and uh, the straw built up the volume of the walls and the cob created the render on the outside. Uh, uh, on the right here is Heather. On the left is Ellen, one of our friends. Uh, and here's me uh, and an almost finished piece of work uh, with Heather. And um, there's, there's the finished piece. Um, it was really at the beginning of when we started to understand this idea, what we might call like integrity of materials. You know, something that you're not going the fastest way to the end. In fact, often you're taking like the slow route or the hard route. But in doing that, the, the, the finished piece has a story, has a narrative, and you have a different connection to it. I mean, for us, for art, our art making is a way to live our lives. We do it because it gives us a life that we want to live. So there's no point us racing through a process from start to finish. The only put reason we do our work is for the process. So we want to find ways of making work that enrich us and uh, in the people around us and the places that we're putting those pieces of work. Um, this is a piece, you've seen a picture of it already. Um, it's from a couple of years ago now, just pre-pandemic. Um, it was a commission um, for air anywhere in North Cambridgeshire. Um, we can make a piece of work. Um, and we, we chose Wick and Fen, which is a, just the original or the last piece of original Fenland um, in Cambridgeshire and uh, in uh, East Anglia and that part of the world. Um, all the rest of that part of the world is, is farmed, really heavily farmed. Um, it belongs to the National Trust and they're also starting to buy up farmland around it to rewild those areas. Um, it's really very, very beautiful place. Um, and quite remote to get to. So there's a few miles or a couple of miles walk to get to this piece. Um, here's the inside of it. So it references the original hayricks. So, um, you know, so again, it's it's coming from a sort of vernacular architecture or vernacular forms. And these are the hayricks that they're, they're absolutely mind boggling um, things to see. Um, that would have been dotted uh, dotted um, the British countryside and particularly uh, in uh, Cambridgeshire. Each area has their own um, form of them. Um, and our Thatcher, well, they're amazing. Um, our Thatcher, um, our local Thatcher that we worked with to create the thatch for the top of our piece, his first job was thatching a hayrick exactly on the site where we built our piece of work. So. We were astounded by the form and we love the fact it helped back to something vernacular, but also 
it looked slightly sci-fi, like 50 sci-fi, you know, it looked like some sort of earth ship, mother ship, something going, taking you somewhere. And that's sort of part of what we're trying to do when we make a structure in the landscape is the idea of reframing people's experience of it. You know, it's like, um, it's like a vehicle that takes you somewhere. Once you step inside it, you know, you're, you're in a different, a different place. Um, for those who like drawings, here's a drawing. Um, the piece itself, I mean, the drawing does reveal um, there's an, the sort of symmetry of it and the regularity of it. When, like repetition is a big part of our practice uh, and our sort of design, uh, how we design things. Um, and there's also sort of this idea of um, some sort of quality in terms of like pieces. Like there's no piece that's more structural than any other piece. It's a very simple structure in that there's just any cross section. It's just a cross section that's rotated around and around and around um, to create this form with three apertures left um, through it. Um, the timber for the piece came from our own uh, forest. We have an area of forest in Wales that we, um, it's old plantation and ancient Celtic rainforest. So we're slowly restoring it back to Celtic rainforest. So there's trees that windblown and there's trees that um, we need to fell. They're mature plantation trees um, as part of a, you know, this um, process of regeneration. Um, we then bring them back to the workshop where we all mill them into the boards. We'll join them at the workshop. Um, we find that's the most efficient way to be on site, which means when we're on site, everything can be done without any power tools. So it's a much nicer um, process for for you to build in a nicer process uh, in terms of being out in in the wild as well without you know we don't need generators or anything like that um, here's the the piece from inside looking up as we're just closing in um, the final thatch and here's Heather just finishing up the final touches uh, it's a, it was a piece that just to touch back on why we make things and process this is a piece that we, were, we began with the thinking about nature and mental health. We'd just read um, Richard Maybe's book um, called Nature Cure, um, in which he, he actually goes to this part of the world, it's Anglia, um, and he's been, he's suffering, he's had suffered a mental breakdown. And it's about him reconnecting with the landscape and using the landscape um, uh, to help heal, I guess. And, um, we had that very much in mind as we we're making the work about how you can, um, what, how can you help people reconnect with the landscape? Um, and um, I think the interesting thing for me was, I was also going through quite a bad stage myself and the process of creating this, going back to milling timber, working with straw, you know, uh, finding uh, local materials, working with local craftspeople to build this, and the sort of joyful process of being on site and building it over the course of a couple of months was an incredibly powerful and a restorative process for me um, to do that. Um, and I don't think I think that's something that should be thought about more when we make things. Um, so the final project. Um, I forgot to start my timer, so I'm not sure where we are at, but just a couple more minutes to talk through this one. This is a piece we're working on at the moment, so there's no finished piece to look at. Um, it's a commission with Yorkshire Sculpture Park on their really beautiful site. Um, and it's a co-commission uh, with the Oak Project, which is this new organization that specifically is working with artists and uh, researchers and theoreticians um, to see how art can help with nature connectedness to help people reconnect with nature in order that you know um, environmental change can um, come about that people feel engaged and they can see uh, the consequences of their actions um, and this is the first commission they've, they've made for it we wanted to make a piece of work that really spoke of uh, that helped people understand where they sit within nature and uh, spoke a little bit of the change that's already happened so the piece itself is called silence the conceit of it is it's a circular structure in which you go in and you're not allowed to speak so you some sort of, sort of contemplative space where you may begin to hear nature in some sort of way in a way that you hadn't before but equally it's a space where you realize the lack of natural sound that's already come about 
Um, I'll just go through the process. Um, so it's the site of the piece itself works with a stand of uh, silver birch trees. It's circular structure. Um, again, it's got timber slatting on it. Again, milled from our own forest. Um, and um, this is us on site a couple of weeks ago. Um, just popped the post going straight into the ground for those people who like these things. Um, this is my son just helping out during school holidays. Um, around the bottom of the wall, we basically have two passageways. Okay, let's show here. You can see it here. There's, there's two walkways, really, or rather, two walls of which you walk down a corridor um, between the slatted walls into a central space. Um, the bottom section of those walls is made out of rammed earth. I think we're going to hear more about rammed earth today. The earth is just a great process to sort of spend time with a site, getting your hands really dirty, mixing up lots of mixes, just to get that balance of um, sand and clay just right. And then, you know, mixing it, wetting it, um, ramming it to something that feels really amazingly, amazingly solid. Um, and the roof structure is a grid shell. Uh, so it's a lattice of very fine timbers going in two directions at two different uh, angles each. Um, and then on top of that will be a heather thatch, which actually, here we go. So this is the heather thatch that we um, harvested from the moors, Yorkshire moors, just recently. Um, it's a regenerative process. The heather grows back. It gives you the most beautiful purpley sheen when wet and then held down by these willows that we just, just cut actually yesterday. Um, and that's it. I think I'm probably at 10 minutes now, so um, I look forward to questions later. Sorry, I'm just going to be sharing screen. Thanks a lot, Ivan. That was um, super interesting, particularly as I'm going to be talking about some rammed earth too. Um, so I'm going to, um, my name's Jonathan, Jonathan Tucky, and I'm going to talk about two, two projects. I'm going to show two projects that are currently um, in our studio. One's on site and the other one is uh, recently finished. One made out of earth um, and the other one made out of timber. Um, we were inspired to consider rammed earth for building a house because it just felt like using the ground around you, if the opportunities are there, is um, really where where we should be. Go you know where, where we should be, uh, how we should start a project. I think it's it's fascinating. It's great that we're finally starting to value the carbon in the making and delivery of new things, and increasingly the carbon embodied in the existing things around us. So if you're using that, the kind of earth beneath your feet or the earth of the site, it reduces both the material production and the transportation to zero. So this is the clay from our site on the right and the crushed aggregate that's also from some of the buildings on our site on the left. And it's, it's the combination of those two roughly in a proportion of one to two or one to three that forms this sort of magic ingredient for round earth. Uh, the middle is this very beautiful map. It's the first geological map of England. It was uh, drawn in 1815 by a guy called William Smith and beautifully colored to delineate the different strata beneath us. And you can see in the, in the center band with, with London at, in its center, this pale um, beige gray, which is the clay that sweeps in a kind of triangle shape across southern England, framed by chalk on either side in, in green. And our site marked by that, uh, by that red line, more or less is at the tip of the end of this spur of clay that is what's needed to, to, um, to make round earth. We often think of round earth structures a little bit like the ones I've been showing in sort of, um, in the Middle East or sub or in Saharan Africa. I mean, the Great Wall of China is made of round earth, the Alhambra, but rarely do we think of round earth buildings as being from Northern Europe. But there is a tradition in which they have been, it's been extensively used in the UK, in Europe for hundreds of years, in areas where the clay was good enough to establish a tradition. And these images of houses or buildings in France and in Switzerland um, 
all of which are around two or three hundred years old, show its use both for agricultural barns, for houses, and even for warehouses. And I think that they show a real kind of elemental material beauty and the kind of warmth texture of the earth in their in both their in both the kind of coloration and their formation. And I think it's it's uh, it's exciting to think that this is a tradition that can be revived in Europe, Northern Europe. It's been entirely, it's before it is forgotten, let's say. It's in our, uh, in our latitude though, the material of round earth does have limitations. And I think it's, it's those limitations that make it an interesting uh, material to work with. It's, you'll see in all of these images that it's uh, protected from the ground by some kind of plinth that the building sits on and normally has some either significant or substantial overhang on the top of it so that it needs to be protected from rain at the top and from the, from the groundwater that it might sit on at the bottom. It's also not something that you can naturally make an opening a window or door without framing it as well. So surrounding these windows and doors in these images, you'll see either timber or stone or, or some kind of framework that allows it to be a structure. It can be load bearing, but it needs to be framed. And in both the image on the left and the image on the right, you'll see those the introduction of bands of lime that are there to strengthen and structure, strengthen and structure the weathering on the facades. So as I say, I think it's it's interesting that when you start to use these materials in our geography, that this starts to become the limitations of them start to become the possibilities for kind of interesting forms of architecture. I mean, these very beautiful corner corner pieces on the right hand side of the on the on either edge of the right hand image again are just purely to to protect and weather to protect and um, prevent from weathering the the extremities and corners of this grain store. It's not to be confused with this these images or this. Um, of this material, which is often talked about as being rammed earth, but it's actually um, rammed earth with the clay gone and concrete added. I think it's technically called stabilized rammed earth. And I think it's, you know, this in a sense has no limitations to it. You can see it's, ex you can leave it exposed at the top. It can form openings to windows within its structure and it can sit on the ground. I think this is, it was frequently used. I mean, this is these, some of these projects in the UK and some of them further afield. But it's, I think, it has none of the significant environmental benefits of of pure round earth because the clay has been remo removed and replaced with cement. So not only is the manufacture of the cement something that is to be avoided, but equally the transportation of the materials to the site prevent it being something that's absolutely from the earth. So back to our our site in Wiltshire and um, you'll see that uh, th these are the kind of first samples of different aggregates and clay mixes that we're starting to produce on the right hand side and shows that what a kind of enormous variation you can get in between just on the same site and the kind of color definition between one uh, one area that we might be taking our clay and aggregate from and another. And then on the, the left-hand side, a bigger scale sample. This is a photograph from a project by the, the architect we're collaborating with, Martin Rauke, who's a sort of long established tradition of working with this material in Austria. And this shows these lime checks that are introduced at, at more or less 400, to 400 millimeter intervals between the different bands of round earth and those as I said earlier, strengthen and uh, encourage, encourage the weathering to be um, focused on those areas. They actually end up being slightly protruding drips or sills and allowing the face of the round earth to stabilize at the, at the point where the aggregate is revealed. And I think produces this very, almost like a line drawing on the face of the building. And again, a part of, part of the, part of the limitations of the product, of the material, and allow a sort of technical um, experimentation with it. So this is um, a site, of, site plan um, of our site back in around about the turn of the century, 1890. 
the site was originally a brickyard located there, I guess, because of its clay, and they had excavated the good clay from this area. So you ended up having this um, this clay pit revealing, which was now flooded and be had become a pond. And surrounding it, we also had other other buildings that were no longer of need to us, but were going to be the perfect uh, use for our aggregate once we had taken clay from the ground and mixed it with the, the crushed up buildings. And here are some uh, model, these are some photographs of a model that we've got in the studio that are starting to test what the building might be like. Um, you can see the round earth walls, very much the color of the soil on which they're built. They're sitting on a brick plinth uh, at the base of it, which kind of meanders up and down to meet windows and steps to the landscape and protects the base of the earth, the base of the round earth from the ground. And the top of the round earth walls are protected by either overhanging roofs in some instances, like the one in the middle, or brickwork copings, which together with the base, the frame and form a kind of frame for the round earth that is held in between them. I think the earth in itself really has this sort of appearance like sort of somewhere between rock strata and a settling plaster, it's sort of part geology and part liquid. So the rammed earth layers really expose the labor of making it uh, almost like geological human time. Each, each of these lime joints that we, I was showing to you previously represent four days of compacting. So there's, there's, a, there's four day joints in between here and then that's marked by a lime joint. And then at the edges, we double up the lime joints around the corners here and around window reveals. I mean, these are just model photographs, so it's not super precise, but the work ends up being a kind of a bit more detail around windows and around corners to protect the, the weather from those areas. It's, it's sort of monolithic and load bearing nature lends itself to the large openings having no lintels to the round earth at all. So it feels like instead of forming a lintel across here, we've actually set back the lintel so that the timber window has a bigger timber lintel. So the, the top of the building has this almost crenellated top to it, which I think will exacerbate the, the kind of strength and materiality of the, 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 the round earth structure. So because the material is on site, um, it's in the ground around us, the usual rules of minimizing materials to reduce cost are reversed in this instance in this instance so making thin walls is much more fiddly and awkward and more time consuming and more costly so the resultant building has walls that are wide enough to stand within the building when it's being made so you have this thick castle-like structure of the building that that allows windows and doors and stairs to be carved within it niches to be formed within the thickness of the structure. And within the interior, these walls are, I think a real connection between the ground and the landscape. Uh, in places they're left exposed and the round earth is revealed and in other places that's covered with a clay plaster. And in some areas I can hear we're ramming earth on the floor. It's, just, it's compacted round earth on the floor which then has a, um, an oil which gives it a reflectivity to almost like a almost like a lake in the middle of the in the interior of the building and you step through these very thick thresholds into spaces that are completely surrounded by by the earth so this um this is the second project which is a school theater that we finished last year and it was built using cross laminated timber clt i'm sure everyone is familiar with that um, think of it as a, a high-tech product, a kind of engineered invention that allows timber to compete with prefab concrete steel, but has the benefit of storing carbon in the capture captured in it within the growth of trees. But you can see on what scale in this site in Austria they're actually harvesting and and, and using the timber around it. And these, um, th our building was was manufactured here in Austria. It's based in the UK, but it was manufactured here and it was delivered in two lorries um, and assembled in two weeks. And these, these photographs show the building 
and pretty much in its assembled form two weeks later. And I think for all the benefits of this material and the, 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 the sort of technological and environmental benefits of it, it's very, I think it's really easy. It was a really interesting journey for us. It's really easy to produce very dumb architecture with it because the because in a way, in the opposite to the round earth, the building, ha the material has such few limitations. It does kind of too much for you. It, it is very easily the structure, the walls, floor, ceilings. You don't need any buttresses, no framing um, to connect those two walls. You literally need a handful of screws between it. So you end up having no, no elaborate corner detail or something to me mediate between wall and ceiling or wall and floor. Even to make windows, you just cut a hole in it, or make doors, you just cut a hole in it. It doesn't need any framing at all. So it's, I think these images show how easy it is to produce a very bland, featureless, proportionless, um, flat building with it. And it was, it was very much, whilst we wanted the materiality for lots of reasons, we didn't. We certainly didn't want those qualities to the to the to the resultant um, theatre. I guess we wanted a building with much more three dimensionality to it, to, much more relief to it, um, but nonetheless still to be a timber building, to be a CLT building. So we looked quite. We took quite a low tech approach to adding things to it. Um, you can see it's, um, this is the interior, the finished interior of the theatre. On the right, and then a, a drawing of the buttons on the left. And very simply, we just got a whole lot of timber buttons, rough sawn timber buttons, that were visibly screwed onto the interior, introducing a, a proportion, vertical and horizontal proportion, like a rhythm to it. It, it was it very assisting for the acoustics to, of the building as well. But it it doesn't disguise the round earth that is absolute, not the round earth, the the CL2 that is absolutely present in the in the space but it it adds another layer another layer to it let's say and the benches for example again we chose a kind of mini clt to make them we found this 18 mil material that was exactly the same species of the clt it was large it was a uh, another um, three sheet mdf large and the, in that thinness, we're able to introduce more detail and richness to to that that somehow allows you to to consider the the CLT background as part of this collaboration of a more detailed materiality, but albeit nonetheless just screw fixed to, together or um, or visibly you're visibly able to see how the building is connected and assembled and disassembled. So they were they were made in an overly tectonic way i suppose the exposed junctions i guess trying to bring some more legibility and um and uh truth to the to the clt building on the exterior so i see it to be on the so you've got to put the insulation somewhere and so our insulation was on the outside and again in rather like the interior we didn't want the outside just to become a flat uh, a flat box with no expression of relief or 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 shadow on it, and so we introduced this a kind of hung tile system of panels that um, bring some proportion and fineness to what would have been a very flat flat building. So these two were kind of just manually fixed, each batten and panel screwed to the building behind it, so that you could. Very much see how it was assembled and just sort of disassemble it yourself. And I think, I suppose these two buildings, these two materials, both earth and timber, to me, in one of them, that there are these constraints, the round earth and limitations, and what, and those we're using those in a way to drive what we can do with the material. Whereas in the other, the material, the, the CLT had very few limitations, and so it was, it was trying to deal with a very low tech way in which we could add complexity to it that both collaborated with it rather than fully concealed it. Thank you.
and design principle of Turinscape. Today's topic is Sponge City, a nature-based solution. Now, Turinscape is a landscape architecture and urbanism practice based in Beijing. It's constantly developing and implementing nature-based solutions to address environmental issues across scales, from eco-home to ecological urbanism and to the national scale planning. And it has become a major advocate for the sponge city concept. As a concept of sponge city is a nature-based solution to address climate change plus problems, including flood, drought, pollution, habitat loss. Now the conventional solution of grey infrastructure simply lack resiliency. Now the alternative is a nature-based solution to create ecological infrastructure that provide holistic ecosystem services, particularly the regulation of water. And the nickname for this water-centered ecological infrastructure is called green sponge, mainly the retention and cleansing of water, recycle and use water to recharge the aquifer. Now the city built upon this kind of ecological infrastructure is called sponge city, a resilient city based on nature. First is to make a plan, planning a green sponge system from the river system, recovery of wetland pond system, and the building storm water management, rain gardens in the community. So it's a whole ecological infrastructure. And based on this plan, you create a green sponge. And this green sponge is inspired by the ancient wisdom of farming and water management. And we test it and we designed to create replicable modules so that it can, they can be used in modern ecological engineering. Here are just examples of some nature-based design and engineering modules, such as terracing, ponding, diking, and islanding. As the whole idea is to retain water at its source, slow down the flow of water, and at its sink to adapt the water. This concept is totally opposite to the modern gray infrastructure engineering, which is the concentrate water, to speed up the water, and to fight against water, to take water as enemy. Practicing for over 20 years, we have built over 500 projects in more than 200 cities nationwide and in about 10 other countries global-wise. I just wanted to give you two recent projects as examples, how the sponge can work to solve the water-associated problems. The first project is in China's Hainan Island, Sanya City. The problems are very usual in the monsoon climate, flood, pollution. Now make a plan. We have to envision the, the individual project as an integral part of the green sponge system for a water resilient city. The blue system is a water centered system, which is based on this process analyze of precipitation, flow of water. So first of all, is to give water more space and to find where we should give water more space and then find the key point to practice the sponge design. 
the great green sponge at the critical point in the inner city. This is a, an example. It is about one kilometer in size, right in the middle of the city of Sanya. So inspired by terracing, ponding, diking, islanding, we designed this landscape. Here you can see when the, when the slope is steep, they create terraces so that the, the flow of water can be slowed down. And as a periphery of the, the, the site, you create as a pond and dike system to catch urban runoff, to clean the water, and then recharge aquifer. And in the middle of the part, we just use simple cut and fill create a forest over the lake. This is rendering, you can see here, very simple technique. And it just take a couple months from rendering to all the way to create this the site. And this bunch, you will see the, the function as a water cleansing system and retention system. In just a couple of years, we built a beautiful park and you, here you can see under the canopy, we have a habitat for rich biodiversity. The bird, bird watching, photographing, people here hiking. Now this is the islands in the middle of the park. Each island have one single banyan trees, but we create a whole forest over the lake. Now the performance is amazing. In just three years, we virtually solved the problem of urban inundation right in the middle of the city of Sanya. Another example, Mesa River drainage system, also in Hainan Island, the another city called Haiko City. Again, you will see the river is suffering flood, pollution, and people try to solve the problem by this kind of concrete machine dredging. They keep doing for 20 years and never solve the problem. The city get flood annually. Now this is after, just one year after the project. Here, how we do it. Use the idea of sponge city. Remove the concrete, concrete. Go back to nature. Terracing the river bank so that the, the water flow can be slowed down and it can be cleansed up and recharge the aquifer. And at the same time, create a habitat for biodiversity. You can see the mangrove get recovered so that the city can become more resilient and the river can provide more ecological services. This is a terraced riverbank function as a water cleansing system. A lush vegetation. It just two years after the project was executed. These islands are created using the recycled concrete materials. And the, the birds you can see come back to the city. And this is how the river perform with the removal effect and the cumulative removal rate of nutrient. It's amazing. 85% of nutrient of phosphorus can be removed from the water. So more than ever, we have to rethink the way we build our cities and the way we treated water and the way we live. We need a revolution. I call it a big fit revolution, which means we have to respect nature based on nature to solve the multiple urban water issues. Global wise, not just in monsoon climate. Thank you.
we have four very different approaches. Hello, hello everybody. We have four very, very different approaches to regenerative design. And, you know, here we are, if we if this event were live, we would be with it in the Jarvis Hall and the hallowed halls of the RIBA, which is kind of the mainstream of the profession. And to get to what the three of you are talking about, and even to what uh, uh, the Chinese landscape architect is talking about, you know, it seems such a big leap from where the mainstream of the profession is today. And certainly Paloma has made some rather provocative remarks uh, uh, along that line. And um, I'm really heartened to Jonathan to see your beautiful projects because, you know, I've been banging on at the AJ for years about how, you know, we need to reinvent a new aesthetic at working with these materials in a different way. It's not, it's, an, it's not just a technocratic solution of, you know, heat recovery, ventilation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, so the question, the you know the really difficult question with this is is how do we how do we make this happen? How do we scale this up? You know, here we are talking about it in the RBA. That's already a big step forward than say even five years ago. And you know we have architects declare. We have a practice like Hayworth Tompkins that's appointed a a person called head of regenerative design. I think other practices will follow. But um, I guess I'll come first to you, Paloma, because you're really pushing boundaries with what you're trying to do in terms of compostable materials, not just reusable and recyclable materials. How do we, how do we roll this out? I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, for sure. Um, I guess my talk was uh, intentionally provocative. I was just trying to cram as many ideas as I could into 10 minutes. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's doing the things which we're all doing, which is um, testing these materials out, demonstrating that they work, demonstrating that they not only work, but they often work better than than the materials that we've um, got used to. Um, so that that's one thing, but it, ultimately, I think it will come down to things like regulation and um, you know a kind of frameworks which will enable um, these kind of new or very old materials to compete um, with with the other ones. I mean, I guess there is the kind of prospect of increasing prices of oil, which will potentially kind of tip the balance of what increasing prices of oil. Oh um, yeah. Which might tip the balance, um, you know, back in our favour or on the, in the planet's favour. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think until we have something like regulation, um, and I just fear that we'll only get to that point once kind of the um, disasters have reached a certain um, level. Yeah. Um, unfortunately. Uh, but they're, they're here, you know, the, the, the technology and the systems exist and we, we know that it, that it works. It, it's just, um, yeah, what it, what it will take to tip that balance. I mean, the work that we're doing in Yorkshire is quite interesting in that respect. It feels really exciting that there's a local authority um, engaged in the idea of what it would mean for them as a region, you know, to, to kind of become a kind of uh bio-based economy it's really really exciting and it's that kind of thing i think that will change things but but you just begin to see the kind of scale of the the problem and the transition that needs to happen so mm. well um, we need examples yeah. that and yeah we need these examples so ivan you're you're working on the kind of you know your work in inspires people raises awareness engages people with these issues um, in the time that you've been doing this, do you see, do you sense that there's kind of more traction, more interest? How, how do you, how do you, what's your take on that? Is, is, are we reaching some kind of tipping point here? Um, I think it's really hard to say that, that definitely, I mean, we must all have been able to track, there has been a change in, you know, wider change in people's perception. Um, the very fact that 
we're now being commissioned by an organization that's looking to link research and think you know academic thinking with art in order to reconnect people is is great that you know that, that they see they understand the 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 benefit in terms of creating projects that raise awareness um I mean, my my concern was always like, what what are we doing that's useful in this? You know, um, and I I hope that I hope. I mean, with these specific projects, it's about making people care enough to bother to to change behaviour. Really, yeah. Um, you know that they they may visit one of these works or read about these works or read about some research that's come from these works. You know, and it helps helps make that connection stronger um and we saw that with mother a lot and that was it's interesting mother was there about it was commissioned well our thinking behind it was about disconnectedness from nature this or, or the, the jarring disconnect between modern lives and the natural world and and then it was essentially closed but all through the last year it's been open is it still there? Can people visit it? Yeah, it's, it's due to go. I mean, it's two years overdue going. You know, the pieces we make are often temporary. Um, and it has been an amazing sort of salve, I think, for people to go there. I mean, everyone's had this new experience in nature. I know that. Um, but in a sense, it's about focusing that and making people understand they're having a new experience and framing it in some sort of way. So mm -hmm. I, I hope the works do that. And I, I hope there is a progression towards something meaningful as in terms of change, you know, whether that's behavioral change or I think as Paloma was just saying, you know, in terms of sort of uh, regulations, really, you know, the carrot and stick, I guess, change. So, Jonathan, you're you're in the position of running a mainstream practice, or and you have worked for larger practices before you set up your own. You know, so this project you're working on is a is a one-off house. Um, so that's kind of a, in its own category. It allows for a certain experimentation. But even let's talk about the school. Did you have? Was it challenging to convince them to go with a timber building and? No, I, I, I don't think so. I think, I mean, I, it wasn't, it wasn't a difficult decision for them to make. But I think that um, a bit like both Ivan and Paloma were saying, in a way, in our roles, in our small way, we've just got to inspire people, both clients, colleagues, whoever we're talking to, that that this isn't, this isn't, you know, that there's some really exciting opportunities when you do this. You know, that, and what was really exciting, what was very enjoyable about the the school client was we obviously persuaded them that the CLT was going to be the right route for them but they're they're as sort of converted as anyone now in terms of that being a way in which anything they else anything else they will do will be with that mindset it won't, might not be with that materiality but will be with that mindset and I think that that in itself will have influenced the community around that project whether it's the people who paid for it the fundraisers the kids or the or the staff and and head teachers who commissioned it. So, I think that's that's where, in 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 our world, we do in the in the world of the designer or architect, you come across it's such a collaborative process, both with the people who are building it, the people who are commissioning it, and the people who end up using it. Well, especially as you explore new materials and you're yeah. reaching out to you know the specialist to to you know get additional expertise on your round earth. Project. Yeah, so so I think that I think that's that's the very least we've got to do, um, and I think the more the more the circles of that increase, then it will you you very very much hope that regulation isn't far behind that. Mm. Um, but I th and I think I, you know I feel reasonably optimistic that with enough of us talking about it and in, and hopefully inspiring people with what the outcome is, whether it's a private dwelling or a, or or a sculptural piece or a public building, that it will just become something that more people want to be part of or more to want to work in that way. And I think that, I think, I mean, there's the, the growing conversation is obviously about embodied carbon. I think we've got, a, we've got um, an interesting way ahead where you think of the, our cities, the, the housing stock that we all live in is 
has got enormous embodied carbon but is, isn't doing very well in terms of how it performs. And I think that's going to be a really interesting challenge for the next 10 years is because a lot of us like the look of what those buildings look like and what they bring to the street, but actually they perform like a building from the 1890s. And it's actually how do we, how, how do we make them have a sustainable future but without um, any sort of strategy towards whole scale demolition or something? Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be quite an interesting. I mean, particularly what Paloma was talking about, the, 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 we can't, we're not going to fill them all with uh, petrochemical insulation. So it's it, that that's going to be a very interesting journey that we all want to be get get talking about quite quickly. I think. Hmm. Well, we have. Uh, I'm encouraged by the real interest in you know what what. Chloe and the RIBA is curated here because we have more than 260 people on the call. So people are interested in learning about this and learning about, you know, exemplars that, that are paving the way, which is exciting. We're now going to take some questions. Um, we have Tarn Philip. Can you, hello, can you introduce Hi. yourself? Shok, sure. can you hear me? Yes, you're on. Hi. We um, can see you. Yeah. I'm actually uh, an ex-student of Paloma's from a couple of years ago, um, working as an architectural assistant. Um, thank you all for a very insightful um, sort of presentations and discussion. I have a question which is directed to Paloma. Um, I was just wondering whether you could talk a little bit more about um, the sort of ongoing materials culture research you're doing and how these prototypes and natural building systems that you're developing might be scaled up for larger projects, um, sort of on an urban scale? Yeah, great question. Thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, so I guess the ha we, we built this house in Cambridgeshire, um, uh, mainly, well, parts of it were made um, from hemp, which we grew in the field next door. I showed a couple of images of of it in the, in the talk and I guess that was a kind of prototype uh, for a potential kind of type of housing that could be scaled up so it was designed to be built off site it's panelized it's ba based on a kind of eight by four grid and um, so kind of just standard sheet material dimension um, and the the each of the panels can be um, lifted by a high app so a very kind of readily available kind of cheap crane essentially on the back of the truck um so we were thinking at that time about scalability you know working with these materials that we're really interested in and we think are, are the future so things like hemp it sequesters huge amounts of of carbon and um, much much more quickly than um many other kind of grown materials uh, and then, of course, timber. So we sourced all the timber from within the UK. Um, and we're very kind of careful around, um, I guess, all of the kind of material derivation, where everything came from. Uh, and then on the, on the side, kind of in parallel, we were developing a cladding. Um, it's actually one of the, the hardest things um, to achieve, other than timber cladding, um, is a kind of viable product. So we, we worked with the what's called the shiv, so the woody core of the plant to make the insulation for the building and the fibre to make a, a new cladding system. Um, so in a way it all kind of, mostly everything kind of worked uh, and paid off and it was it was, it was was quite cheap to, to put together. I mean the construction is incredibly simple um, and we are now looking at uh, well, working on projects where the same principles are going to be applied at scale. Um, so, particularly currently, this I guess the the one that feels the least kind of diluted is a project in Lewis um, that we're beginning work on. Where there's an idea that we will establish a kind of micro factory on site. Um, so we're looking at anything from kind of 50 to 250 homes being produced in in that manner. Um, where the hemp will come from, I don't know. <laughs> Whether we'll be setting up a kind of a, a plantation, I'm not sure. But there are or there are huge um, in in Yorkshire uh, two very large hemp growers. There's a lot of stuff being produced in this country at the moment. The, the kind of seed in just just isn't there. So there aren't 
in a way there aren't that many barriers i mean it, yeah i think it will take demand to drive uh, uh kind of production in the supply chain kind of coming through um and i think that's in a way the trickiest thing and it, it will take time for that to develop in, in a kind of meaningful way and until then we'll still be importing things mm. i've got just a technical question mm -hmm. what's, what's the hemp doing is it and how's it processed to do that is it structural or insulating is it a board a panel it's um hemp crete which is what it's known as is, is incredibly crude material so it's it's kind of straw the mm. hemp herd chucked chopped up into kind of short mm. lengths of straw. And the reason it's he um, hemp rather than um, barley or wheat straw is just that it has a slightly more kind of resistance to crushing. It's got a spongy core. Mm. So it holds air. Uh, you mix it with lime uh, and basically the, the hemp is holding the air. So it's creating the insulation and then the lime is, is kind of binding things together, but in quite a loose way. It's, it's a bit more like Weetabix than, than a kind of building material that you might be familiar with. Um, so it's, it's crumbly and really you, most people would probably want to put a render on, with, on it, which you can very readily. But the good, good thing about the combination of those two materials, I guess, is that, um, yeah, the hemp is your insulator, but the lime gives you thermal mass. So you're not only insulating, but you're able to kind of hold heat. And that's one of the kind of criticisms of kind of lightweight timber frame construction often is that you're kind of missing out on that thermal mass element. Um, but it also kind of protects against fire, you know, it comes up with all of these other kind of qualities. And it gives you a rare thing in kind of contemporary construction, which is wall mass. So it gives you that kind of physicality of material, which in kind of contemporary layered construction we've lost. Great, um, thank you. We have another question from the audience, Jess. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, can you introduce yourself please? Yeah, sure, so um, my name is Jessica. I'm a digital archivist, but I'm also interested um, in architecture. And I wanted to ask um, the panelists, um, in your view, is there an opportunity to be had in the UN climate conference being held in the UK this year? And I guess what with the policies or the changes that need to be agreed upon um, this year to sort of bring these building solutions you're suggesting to a wider, more mainstream usage? Thank you. Does, who would like to answer that? Well, I think or, I'll answer one, one thing I think would be brilliant if it happened is to um, encourage people to work with existing buildings more. I mean, there's this ridiculous tax regime where people, if you demolish a building, you do it, you know, and build a new one, you get that zero. Uh, and whereas if you work with an existing one, you pay 20% and that seems absurd. It doesn't happen in most other countries in Europe. And uh, it's ridiculous that we are hostage to the construction industry and we, that needs to change. But my colleagues, uh, in particular, my colleague Will Hurst at the AJ is is championing that reform as part of the AJ's Retro First campaign. And we're about to release a film which is going to focus on all of this. And I think there's going to be a tremendous, um, I mean, it's, first of all, it's not clear if the event's going to take place live, hybrid, virtual, be postponed still a bit up in the air but i think that, that there's a tremendous amount of momentum right now to make change and the momentum i i've just written about this for the aj the momentum it, we've got to build on that momentum and keep things moving and i think the whole you know if you think about where the discussion on embodied carbon was 10 years ago or even five years ago and you know i think with aken putting together this excellent report that you can download from their website it spells it out in red and white, in black and white, you know, the timeline we need to move at and the levers for change in terms of policy. And ACAN is planning to to be present in Glasgow and, and push as hard as they can. And I think, you know, everyone, I mean, the UK GBC is totally, totally on this. They've got five task forces set up to look at different building types and what is the journey to net zero. And, and obviously the UK government is, you know, wants to make a, a big statement, um, but, you know, the difference between making statements and setting targets and actually being able to do it and passing regulation is, is still 
um, ahead. <laughs> uh, anyone else want to add anything on, on that one? Uh, so we had another question from Anthony. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please okay. introduce yourself. Uh, well, my name is Anthony. Um, I just finished my bachelor in architecture and right now I'm doing the internship. And my question was maybe a bit touched because what was common for all your projects was this natural uh, context for the buildings or uh, yeah for the projects. And I'm interested also in the if the the solutions that you do, you provide, the, especially maybe the Ramat Earth, is it also understandable and sustainable in the urban and very dense city fabric? Yeah, that would be it. <laughs> Jonathan, do you want to take that one, or do you have a view? Well, I mean, I think the the uh, part of the benefit of using it is is uh, is not having to uh, is having the earth around you. Yeah, so if you're starting to transport earth from one part of the uh, country to another part of the country, that is it's less ideal, I guess. And uh, there's no, there's I don't there's there's no building physics reason why it wouldn't be entirely possible to build a building around earth anywhere. Um, in terms of it, it can it can work in an urban situation, but I think it's um, for the for the drying, production, and curing of the earth. It needs quite a lot of space around it, so sort of a dense dense urban situation is slightly harder. But the 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 colleague we're working with, Martin Rauch, as I mentioned, based in Austria, who's who's been um, at the forefront of rammed earth architecture for 20, 30 years. He is. He's prefabricating round earth. He's he's making he's, he's got a big factory set up near him where they're prefabricating yeah. vast round earth panels. And um, there's quite a well known building for Ricola in Laufen, which is made out of round earth. It's 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 absolutely beautiful, and it it obviously it's got the the benefit of it hasn't got any. It's you know, everything that Paloma was talking about in terms of its materials that that. Um, can just go back into the ground if they need to. It, you know, it is doing exactly that. So, short of the transportation, it does everything like that. And it's um, so. I think in that sense, it'd be very possible to imagine rammed earth, seeing a lorry piling through London with a whole lot of rammed earth panels on it, waiting to be assembled in the centre of town for sure. Yeah, and uh, Martin Rao has uh, written a book, a really interesting, very readable small book with Anna Herringer on this topic. Which, and it, it talks, I, I can't remember the exact title, but it came out a year or two ago and it's a very, uh, in, well, it publishes a lot of these very beautiful projects, but it also talks about how they're looking at standardizing this and, and the components that can be used to, uh, I mean, as Paloma was talking about, hempcrete can be both in situ and can come in blocks as well. So that doesn't, that also is well suited for, for being transported on you know, to places, isn't it? I think that question as well sort of embodies this idea, of this disconnect between nature and the urban. You know, we, like how could you, the question is really saying, how could we have like a natural material in a city? You know, like why couldn't we? You know, of course you could have a natural material. In a city, you know, it doesn't have to be a man-made material to, to be in a sort of man-made environment necessarily. Yeah, as you just outlined something. All those things can can be done as simply mm. as any other man-made material. Mm. Um, we've got one more question uh, that we're going to take from the audience from Deepa. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for that talk. That was really insightful. Uh, and I'm a part one graduate. Um, so my question is, uh, as part one graduates, how can we increase our participation towards sustainable solutions for existing and future problems in architecture? Experience in this, really great to know how you got started. Who wants to take that? I didn't get all the question, but how can, how can you get started? How can how, can you can you say it again, Deepa? Is it how can one get involved in in making change? Basically, is that your question? Yeah, as especially as recent graduates. 
and gaining experience in this area? Well, I would say join ACAN, the Architects Climate Action Network. They have, they have done an incredible amount in a very short two years. You can have a look at their website. They have loads of work streams. They've just started a new work stream on natural materials this week. It's on Twitter and they welcome all levels of expertise. You don't have to feel like you have to know something. You just join in and get stuck in and get busy. And they have done amazing amounts of work and amazing amounts of energy. And it's a, there's, you know, it's, it's, I'd say the landscape is very different from what it was a decade ago. If you're interested in this topic, there's just so much information out there now. And um, so I would say, you know, just start asking questions and get involved. I would say also, um, Deep, make sure the practice you're working at, ask them what they're doing about it and ask everyone you've studied with to make sure they ask the person they're working with what they're doing about it because it's, it's, yeah, it's a, it doesn't, this isn't a topic that comes from top to down or it, it mm. is a topic that the sooner people start questioning what we're all doing about it, it becomes quite clear that most of us haven't been doing the right thing for a long time. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's interesting. I don't know whether that was just chance. I would really love to see the the landscape of the audience. And I hope some of this audience, you know, it's great that we have all these recent graduates interested in this topic, but we can't wait around for the recent graduates to be designing all the buildings we need to be designing in the, you know, in the near term. So uh, Jonathan's absolutely right. You know, this needs to come from the top. It needs to come from the bottom. It needs to come from all angles if we're going to get there. And um, I'll just add for, for deeper. I mean, um, it's, I think, uh, Hattie, you're right. You know, you need to join the conversation. Um, and when you, but you, I'm come from like a doing background. You know? I, that's the other thing I was going to say, and uh, I would think Paloma would add to that as well. That you know, l learning by making things is 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 the absolute. You know, absolutely. You know, and especially as we're, you know, we we're not look, looking necessarily at traditional technologies. I mean. We're looking to, to them for te for inspiration, but we're also looking, as Paloma is doing, to innovate as well. And you can do that by research, but you, you learn so much by understanding materials in a physical sense, you know, by, you know, knowing how things build, to see, you know, building things and seeing them fall down. These, mm -hmm. these sorts of things are invaluable to know, you know. And the, the best architects we've ever worked with are also ones that can build the buildings that they're designing, you know, or have built something that they've designed so i just recommend that you know build some stuff and there are more and more opportunities for that now you know many mm -hmm. many schools are have these kinds of maker spaces and and programs you know actual build studios i think it's invaluable it's it's totally invaluable now yeah, let's see. I'm just checking the chat. I think that's it on the on the questions. Or is is there one more, Ivan? No. Oh yes, there is one more, Attila. Hello, guys. Can you hear me? That's for everyone. Yes. Hello, panel members. Um, it was fantastic to hear everyone's input. By the way, it's really uh, really interesting for someone because I work for a smaller architect practice and stuck on trend and also is seeking a very wrong not to but i think my question was for van and those other members as well which is in reference to you know your work is quite natural organic it's you know really free forming and you know you, you base it on the context of the site but as I, I know you kind of touched it up on it slightly earlier which was did you have much public responses and um you know do you have a lot of good feedback from that and do you think that um I know I'm stumbling my words here, is the, is the way of bringing in more biophilic materials such as those you've used into the, the current um, sort of contemporary architecture. And also, have uh, you guys also signed up to the 2030 Climate Challenge? I'm just spitting out very quickly, so sorry. No, you're right on it, because Alan Jones just put in the chat that, uh, you know, one thing you can do is ask your employer if if they've signed up to the, to the uh, RIBA's 2030 Challenge, because that is a very good way to stretch um to stretch but in terms of the other part of the question 
for how to introduce more of this into into a small practice is that your is that is that the gist of it attila more biophilic materials jonathan or, or paloma do you want to take that are you asking about the public, public response attila yes yeah, so the combination of both really i mean it's quite I'm saying is that how do you incorporate it? Because I've done my uh, dissertation on it, and it's quite interesting to see the mental, physical benefits on members. And mindset there were when you said that people did have you, know, you had your time and through using within architecture and your design and art, it really influenced it. I think it's important that we incorporate it. But you know, how do we, you know, in your guys' opinions, how do we incorporate that more to the public? The members, I part of me feels, could it be through younger education influencing members from the earlier stages to then you know, therefore make a massive impact in the long run. But again, yeah, I know I'm such a waffle, so I do apologize, guys. So yes, the law is now, I guess. Well, you know, it, the encouraging thing is, you know, I've been writing about this topic for maybe 12 years now. And so I am seeing the first generation of, you know, the likes of Paloma students or Sophie Pelsmaker students coming through and they're now actually doing it. And so it is going to happen, but it's, it's, it's not an overnight process. And I think every single practice is on a journey and there are different places in the journey. And, and I think, you know, events like this, you know, seeing what's possible, seeing, you know, that you can push boundaries through the type of, of work that Paloma is exploring and the type of teaching she's doing. And now, you know, she's has a local authority interested and, you know, Jonathan is, is doing these projects and, and, and there are many others. So that's, that's a cause for, you know, optimism. In I'd, this. I'd, I'd like to answer Attila's questions a slightly in terms of like public's, the public's response to these buildings. I guess that's sort of the gist of it. It's just quite more specifically with the response that I've noticed with some of the work that we make is that when something's been taken time over in terms of the making and the materials have a, uh, have kind of been carefully thought about and that's sort of evident in the building itself, the public have a different connection to that space. They feel more connected to that space, you know? it kind of resonates with them in some way, you know, just, just by observing people coming in and out of these spaces, you know, they, there's, you know, they, they, they're connect. Not, they connect. They connect. There's, you know, and we always try to sort of create a situation where they're not, people aren't sort of looking at it like they're part of it, you know? So as artworks, we kind of introduce certain tactics, but you know, there's not just a technical relationship, but the, you know, there's actually a physical relationship they're having with that. And I guess the, the bigger question that Tiller's asking is how, I mean, or from, I'm asking is how do we, how, yeah, I can do that in a very, very bespoke way because I, you know, take ages to build things. And, uh, you know, that's kind of the point of what we're doing. But how can we do that in terms of like something that Paloma might be rolling out for, you know, an estate of houses, you know, like I'm sure that one house is, is beautiful. And that idea of those materials on the wall, you know, the, the, the visible hemp on the walls is, is, is does help does make you connect with it and have a different relationship to the, that building but how can you do that on a mass scale you know so people actually have a new relationship they understand the materials that they're living inside you know and they have you know they understand the cost of that um, yeah absolutely i mean i can only concur with what Evan just said and it, um i think there's just something very tangible tangibly different about being in a in a building that um where you're not kind of layers and layers and layers behind its reality um mm. you know we live kind of paint deep almost in terms of our spatial relationships and uh, yeah you, you feel it when you go into an old building um mm. often you know you feel that sense of kind of being in a place rather than kind of realm of semi-alienation that I think we inhabit a lot of the time actually um, and then that that quality is something that we can still produce it's, it, it just takes a slightly different relationship to to material and construction and and it's something that's enabled by 
these materials, and to be honest, it was very simply, it's enabled by breathing construction um, rather than this absolute kind of obsession with with um, not really not really just airtightness, but kind of you know hermetically sealing everything that comes in and out of the building. Um, yeah, I'll stop there because I could also ramble on. Right. Okay, well, I think we're going to move on to the to the hop in networking platform. I really think this was a fascinating conversation. I wish we had the Chinese landscape architect as well, although it's on such a different scale and different different everything. But this has been a just a, a really interesting conversation. So thank you to the panelists. Thank you to everyone who has signed on to listen and. Um, Thank you to Vitra for supporting a lecture series like this that brings these issues to a broader audience. And a reminder that you can buy uh, Sophie and Nikki's and Nick's book uh, in, in the Hopin platform with I think it's five pounds off. Uh, and um, next month's talk is with the Chinese architect Shu Chan Chan and there are still early bird tickets available. So um, see you in the Hopin network, whoever wants to join. And um, I hope you will follow the rest of this series. Thank you very much. <laughs>